Well, hello and welcome. I'm Dr. Jackie Kiger, a professor here at the University of Arizona Global Campus, and I'll be the host of this session. The session, Living Your Best Life with Positive Psychology and Mindfulness. Now, by joining us today, you acknowledge that this session is being recorded and will be shared with TLC-related materials. The microphones will be muted for this presentation, but we encourage you to post questions and comments in the chat. Now, when I say chat, please use the Zoom chat at the bottom of your screen, not the Whova app chat that might be located on the right. Also, we have enabled live transcription. If you would like to use it, click the live transcription button at the bottom of your Zoom window. Now, I'm pleased to introduce you to Devin Nordson of the University of Arizona Global Campus. Devin, the microphone is yours. Thank you so much, Jackie. Appreciate that kind introduction. Uh, let me just uh, show my slides here. There we go. So as uh, he said, my name is Devin Nordson. I'm an academic advisor here at the University of Arizona Global Campus. Been here for a few years as an advisor, but uh, before that, I spent about 15 years as an academic advisor at the University of Colorado at Boulder. So I've had a lot of years as an academic advisor. During that time, I've been studying the factors that lead to student success. Um, it's been a fun topic, it's very broad. Uh, and it turned out that this topic is even broader than I expected, because it turns out that the factors that lead to student success are the same factors that lead to you living your very best life. So that really led me into this whole field of positive psychology and mindfulness. And that's what we're gonna do, a very quick overview of those fields today. So here's our brief outline, as we have a brief talk. First, I'm just gonna talk about the problem of human brains a little bit, set up our issue. Uh, then we're gonna talk about uh, some of the best highlights of positive psychology that I found in my years of study. And then we're gonna try to decode mindfulness and see if we can get that to work for people because it can be uh, transformative to one's life. All right, so first problem is that we're living in the modern age and yet genetic adaptation takes thousands and thousands of years. So although we're in this modern post-industrial high-tech era, our brains genetically are still pretty much identical to the brains that our Stone Age ancestors had. These are brains that are adapted to Stone Age problems. Uh, as such, happiness is not in the plan, if there is any plan, of evolution. Uh, instead, evolution is factoring for survival, and it's filtering us to be really good at surviving and reproducing, surviving and reproducing. None of that necessarily requires us to be happy at all. So if you want to be happy, this is something to cultivate. This is something you're going to want to choose to develop in your life because it doesn't necessarily come with our genetic program unless you just got very lucky and have a really good set of brain chemistry. Um, one of the issues with our Stone Age brains is that when things stress us out, our stress response, as evolution has given it to us, is a response that is designed to help us fight or flee or do something else physically vigorous and stressful and difficult. Um, but in this modern era, our stresses don't tend to lead to fights or chases. They tend to lead to us still being at our computer or still being on the phone or still talking to our family and not having any physical outlet for those stressors. And this is why chronic stress can be unhealthy to people in the modern age. Uh, there's a great book called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers, where Robert Sapolsky talks about how zebras have incredibly stressful lives. They are running for their lives because creatures are trying to chase them down and eat them on a regular basis. But zebras don't have any stress-related illnesses or problems because their stress response, that fight or flight response, keys them up to run for their lives effectively. And then when they do that and they succeed, the stress response then recedes and they go back to normal and they don't have chronic stress issues. So. What's your takeaway from all that? Well, if you find yourself getting stressed out in the modern era, see if you can take a few minutes to give yourself a physical outlet for it. If you can walk around the block or go dance or run or bike or do something to get it out of your body, that's gonna be a helpful way to keep stress from uh, hurting you. All right, now let's uh, get into the field of positive psychology. This is basically the study of the upside of psychology because almost all the entire field of psychology is all there to tell you why you're crazy or unhappy or what's wrong with you. Almost none of it is designed to look at what the optimal states of psychological health would be. 
And that's why Martin Seligman started this field of positive psychology just back in 1998 with his book, Learned Optimism. Um, very useful book, although if you're interested in it, I would then go to his sequel, his more recent book on well-being theory, uh, which develops the field even more. Uh, but just a couple quick notes on this. Um, we tend to, we notice that people tend to have a happiness set point, which is to say things might happen that are good that might make you happier for a while. Things might happen bad that might make you sadder for a while. But in general, we have an amazing ability to get used to good and bad things and our happiness uh, levels tend not to move for very long. And they tend to gravitate back to a set point that is kind of a norm for everybody. Um, and if you decide, oh, I'm going to be happy by doing lots of fun things and getting lots of pleasures in my life, you know, seeking a hedonistic approach as pleasure for happiness, one of the problems you find, and this is the term they came up with, hedonic treadmill, is that the more you're running forward to try to get more and more happy, pleasurable things to enjoy your life, the more you need to keep getting them just to keep up, the more you get used to it. Um, basically saying how the simple notion of pleasure does not just lead to happiness and a life well lived. It's not quite that simple. Um, and furthermore, we tend to have an extreme bias being concerned about acute events and underplaying the importance of chronic events in our overall happiness, which is to say, oh, big initial crises like a car accident or a medical emergency or something like that, those are the things we focus on. And that's important because we want to make sure we survive those uh, events. But when it comes to the long-term effect on your happiness, those one-time severe things tend to not have a lot of impact. What has a lot more impact are the chronic things in your day-to-day -day life, the things you do over and over and over. So if you want to be a happier person, uh, another tip would be to address those chronic habits, the habitual aspects of your life, more than worrying about the crises that come up. All right, I'm gonna give you about three uh, highlights from the results from all the different researchers that have been working in positive psychology for all these years. And highlight number one, good method to become a happier person is to engage in gratitude. So what is gratitude? Being thankful for what you have, noticing the good things in your life, paying specific attention to them and appreciating them. Um, you know, our problem solving brains look for problems to solve and they don't want to usually spend much time being thankful for problems that are no longer. Um, but they have shown with lots and lots of research, if you just spend a little bit of time every day writing down the things that you're thankful for or noting that in some way, that that can be a practice that can make you permanently happier. Now, of course, the caveat, it works better with age. They've done this research and found that it did not work nearly as well for adolescents, but it works better and better and better the older you get. And in fact, the oldest people uh, by age are our happiest demographic uh, because among other things, they are really doing well with this gratitude practice. Okay, positive psychology highlight number two is altruism. What is altruism? Altruism is doing something good for someone else with no hope or expectation of reward at all. To do something good selflessly, totally disinterestedly, just something that's gonna help someone, it does nothing for you at all. Some people feel that this doesn't really exist, that people are naturally greedy and won't tend to do things unless they're getting something back. But I have very good news for you. It turns out research has shown that if you do an altruistic act of pure generosity for somebody else, it will make you happier. Now, maybe it might also make that other person happier if you're doing an effective good deed. You might even make the world better too. But even before that, just doing a good deed is proven to make people feel happier. So if there's any generous good deed, any random act of kindness you're thinking, anybody who you think could use something, try, try giving and seeing what it feels like. Um, now, of course, some people would say, well, if you get a good benefit out of it just by feeling better, is it really altruism? Well, that's a philosophical debate you can go to uh, philosophy class and talk about. Um, and of course, I've got book recommendations on the bottom of some of these slides. The Happiness Hypothesis by Jonathan Haidt. It's kind of a, a grand tour of positive psychology. All right, positive psychology highlight number three is flow. Um, flow is a term that was used by uh, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. Uh, that, he wrote that book called Flow, I've noted at the bottom. He was studying the creative process of artists. And while he was studying where creativity came from, what he found was this unique not unique, but a distinct psychological state that these artists went into called flow. Say an artist was in the midst of painting 
and they were fully in their creative process and they're fully engaged in their act of painting, they're thinking hard, they're using their abilities, they're fully engaged in this activity. Um, they found that when you're in that psychological state, you tend to not be self-conscious, which is very good. You tend to not really think much about the passage of time or anything else. And for these reasons, people usually note flow as being one of the happiest states that they are ever in. Now, a lot of people find flow in different activities. Some people find it surfing. Some people find it playing the guitar. Some people find it doing an art or a craft or a physical activity or you know, even computer programming. Anything that engages you completely, such that you're using all of your efforts to manipulate what you're doing, um, can get you into that state of flow. So if you think about the things in your life that you enjoy because they have that aspect to it, Definitely make that a priority in your life. See how much you can cultivate that and how much time you can spend doing those things that get you into flow. Okay, now with our remaining <laughs> few minutes, let us see if we can decode mindfulness because this is a term that's been around for thousands of years. I've heard a lot of definitions of them and whew, uh, a lot of those definitions did not help me understand it at all. So I'm gonna give you from my synthesis of my best understanding of mindfulness from all the sources I've read, um, but any terms people use to describe it, they say, are like fingers pointing at the moon, which is to say, it doesn't matter what the finger is. What matters is if it gets you to see the moon. So for all these different things, I'm, language I'm going to use to describe this, you grab onto what's useful to you and uh, don't worry too much about it. So mindfulness starts with the one weirdest part, which is changing your relationship toward your conscious mind. Okay, this is the weird part. I use that word disidentify uh, from your stream of thoughts. Okay, this is to say that we all have the stream of consciousness. It's thinking over 50,000 thoughts a day. Okay, uh, and in that stream, you have very little control over what's coming on that stream. A lot of it's incredibly repetitive. A lot of it's neurotic. A lot of it's just mean and nasty or sad and unhappy or stressful and worrisome. There's a lot of those thoughts. And if you're like most people, You've probably been making the same mistake of thinking of those thoughts as you specifically, as being identified with those thoughts, as thinking those thoughts come from your personality and who you really are. But I'm here to tell you, if you really want to do mindfulness, take a new perspective toward your stream of consciousness. Stop thinking of it as you and start becoming the observer of your thoughts. So metaphorically, climb out of that stream that you've been flowing in your whole life, climb up a tree and take a bird's eye view where you can look down on that stream of consciousness and learn to take a perspective of just watching your thoughts go by. You don't have to agree with them. You don't have to disagree with them. You don't have to debate them. You don't even have to consider them. You can just watch them go by, take a deep breath because more are coming down the pike and you don't have to get entangled in them the way most people do, which is the source of so much stress. Um, what you'll find when you start this habit of watching your thoughts, first, you totally lack control over the thoughts that come up. But two, you're going to find that almost all the time, your thoughts are going to be either worrying about the future or planning something about the future or thinking about or rehashing something in the past. Rarely is the stream of consciousness actually engaged in the present moment. But of course, the present moment is the only thing that's actually real. That's where all life is lived. Um, and once you start watching your thoughts and noticing how it's so often not in the moment, you can then start noticing that and focusing and getting back more in the moment. Now, what does that mean to be in the moment? That sounds like a cliche, um, but this is where the mindfulness techniques can help. So you got these thoughts going by, you're usually listening to them and thinking about them too much. How do you first break that? Well, one of the most best ways of doing it is to bring your attention to your breath. Breathing is fascinating because it's an involuntary mechanism that 99% of the time you're not thinking about it. But if you do decide to think about it, you can control your breath and take a nice deep breath. And if you turn your attention to your breath, just observing it closely, whether that's feeling the feel of the air through your nostrils or feeling the rise and fall of your belly button as your diaphragm moves, any specific aspect. If you draw your attention to your breathing, you'll find that you can't also be focusing on your thoughts. So it's a way to break that habitual focus on your thoughts. And when you focus on your breathing, well, now you're in your body and you're in the present moment. You can both feel how you're feeling in your body, which we tend to ignore a lot. 
Uh, and you can then look at what's around you because almost always that present moment is going to be better than whatever you're worrying about in your brain. Another way to, uh, to be mindful and to not be in the grip of your thoughts um, is to immerse yourself in your five senses or maybe just one at a time. Um, some people get complaints of earworms. Have you ever had that problem where a song is going through your head over and over and you, you, you seemingly can't do anything about it? because we're not really in control of our stream of consciousness. Well, one exercise would be to focus on your listening senses and to listen as intently as you can to any single sound, any sound you can hear around you whatsoever. You'll find your brain cannot listen intently and also audiate internally at the same time. Um, so this uh, reaching for your five senses, engaging in your five senses, turning your attention into your body, these are the ways to sort of try to break that habitual process of being focused on your thoughts. Now, let's say you wanna take some practice and just spend some time focusing on your breathing. And then every time you get distracted by a thought, you then turn your attention back to your breath again and do that over and over and over and over and over and over and over. Well, a lot of people would just call that meditation, uh, which is a useful practice. Um, other people would say, hey, if you just think, become aware of your breath, Whenever you can in your day-to-day -day life, every time, even if it's only for one or two breaths, that alone can help ground you in your body and help keep you from being too focused on that conscious thinking mind. Okay. So what are the potential benefits of mindfulness? Well, there's a lot and they're pretty intense. Uh, some people who have been depressed for their whole lives Mindfulness can break that for some people because a lot of people are depressed because they're listening to these nasty, terrible, depressive thoughts and they're believing them. But once they learn to start just uh, letting those thoughts wash by, wash through them and breathe as they go by and to not engage with them and to not believe them and to not get involved with them, they can be in the real world again and find that a lot of people that can help break them out of depression. Um, addiction is another one where people get this, the mental brain drives them crazy. You tell you got to do it. You got to do it. You got to do it until they tend to do it. Well, once you're mindful and you let those thoughts flow by, none of those thoughts have to compel you toward any action. And you can develop a kind of a new, a new handhold to, uh, to try to break a grip of addiction. Another, I would say, major benefit of mindfulness is pain without suffering. That's an interesting one, right? How do you differentiate pain from suffering? Well, there's an old anecdote from, from the Buddha who uh, said that uh, when you get hit by an arrow, for example, he says, you feel the pain twice. This is his story of Buddha's two arrows. It says the first feeling you feel is the physical pain of getting hit by the arrow. The second pain you feel is the mental anguish and the suffering engaged from what has happened. Oh, am I going to die? Oh, who did this to me? Oh, you know, all of that mental narrative that goes through your head as a result. And Buddha says, hey, pain is inevitable, but that suffering part is not. That suffering part is, does not have to follow from the pain. Um, you know, there's a great uh, formula here. Suffering equals pain times resistance. So it's to the extent that you're resisting or avoiding pain that tends to create the suffering. If you are not resisting pain, you can find you can go through lots of pain and not being bothered at all. There are people who run marathons and they experience tons of intense pain and they love it. People climb crazy mountains and they're experiencing all sorts of other pain and loving it. Um, some people even are lucky enough to have a great experience in childbirth that despite incredible pain did not involve suffering. So there are possible ways when you don't resist the pain you're feeling to not suffer from it. Um, that I could get into for a long time, so I'm not going to dwell on that too much more now, so I don't want to run out of time. Other benefits of mindfulness could be discovering patience. You start watching your thoughts and realizing that impatience is this insane desire for it not to be now, but it's always now, and there's nothing you could do to make it not now. And you start recognizing that impatience is this desire to hit some magical fast forward button to skip to this other future part of your life that you wish you could be in right now, that you're sure it would be better than now. Um, once you realize the craziness of all that, now you can watch those impatient thoughts and be like, yeah, yeah, take a breath, enjoy the moment. <laughs> That's all there ever is. Um, you can also find uh, mindfulness can give you uh, less drama in your life and more equanimity as you let the different passionate thoughts you know, roll by you without uh, getting involved in them, you find that you don't have to let any of your thoughts bother you anymore. Um, and that can create 
uh, room for peace, love, and joy. There are a lot of different emotions, uh, and most of them are the traditional passions, anger and you know, sorrow and all those sorts of fear, all those normal emotions we're used to. But there's a whole different category of, uh, of emotions like peace, love, and joy, uh, curiosity, savoring, uh, these sorts of things that are really in the more mindfulness, they're kind of a different dimension uh, of emotions to cultivate, to work toward, and to be less affected by those traditional passions. Uh, that are useful for survival, but not necessarily your well-being. Um, I got a few other things in there, but I, I won't dwell on the rest of that list right now uh, because we're at the point where we have about 10 minutes left and I wanted to make sure that we could do a little bit of conversing. I understand that I don't think I'm able to unmute your microphones, but uh, I'm gonna open up this chat window here and at least uh, see if I can respond to some stuff. Okay, and this is also a great shot. Uh, I'm just looking at the chat. I'm not seeing any real questions at the moment. So if you have any questions or concerns or you want to discuss anything, type something in now, and then I can make sure we tailor these last 10 minutes to whatever you all are most interested in. Um, Eric Piepenbrink wrote that the uh, goal for instructors is to achieve flow while degrading discussion boards. That would be impressive and uh, definitely a good goal to have. Diana writes, mindfulness has been a instrumental in allowing me to focus better on tasks. I have a lot of noise in my head and I can tune it out much better now. I hear you there, Diane. Yep. Uh, and I found that for me in the years of my mindfulness practice, the noise in my head hasn't really changed at all. I just don't react to it like I used to. I just don't have to pay as much attention to it. Um, but the other nice thing I want to distinguish on that is that you're not, when, when you say tuning it out, and that's a, that's a nice term, let's be careful to distinguish that we're not resisting our feelings or thoughts or emotions. We're not avoiding them. We're not fighting or struggling in any way. We're in fact just relaxing and letting them wash right through us and over us. Um, and that is sort of where you can get that hmm, more serene mindset uh, in general. Devin, how would you encourage instructors to use the mindfulness techniques to the advantage of our students? How do you implement these practices when you work with students as an advisor? Okay, well, let me tackle that first question. That second one's gonna be a lot harder. Um, as far as the advantage of students, uh, there's a couple things to note. And I think I, when I'm dealing with traditional college students who are a little younger, them, uh, when I'm helping them with time management, uh, that's where I wanna distinguish between two terms, psychological time and clock time, right? So psychological time is what your brain is in most of the time, worrying about the future, rehashing the past, Etc. And that's what you want to try to notice and get out of and get back into the moment. However, you can't live just in this one instant all the time. If you do no planning whatsoever, you got to show up to work on time tomorrow and make your meetings and plan all your schedules. So for that, you do have to pay attention to clock time um, and make your plans so that you can arrange your life the way you want it. However, it's important to distinguish because a lot of people start worrying about the future and they think, oh, I'm really planning. Well, are you actually planning or are you just worrying? Because if you're just worrying, get back to the moment. But if you need to plan, do your planning, get it done with, get back to the moment. Um, as an advisor working with students, it's hard to get into mindfulness on our conversations, but um, you know, in general, students are stressing about their future a lot, uh, but engaging in the moment is you know, their most productive way of dealing with things. So uh, it's, it's hard to talk about in a short, in a short thing. So I, I don't know that I've done as much mindfulness work with students as I would like to. Uh, Jennifer Hans says, how would you encourage someone to turn off the noise of those around them that may not support them and their pursuit of mindfulness? Um, yeah, I mean, you, you know, I can't turn it off, but I can definitely, you know, stop listening to it and focusing on it. So the breathing technique is the very first thing and it's always available. Every time you have a persistent thought or you don't like a thought, if you just remember, Take a deep breath. Remember, there's the moment um, that I think can help soften your reactions to your thoughts and to, you know, help keep those persistent thoughts from distracting you too much. William Hamilton writes, mindfulness is a form of self-care and students need self-care. I think this is a part of student doing well-being. Yeah, I mean, we all need it. 
it's not just students and it's not just Americans. The whole world, mental health statistics are getting worse every year and they have been for quite a while now. The whole world of humanity could, you know, we've done a lot technologically, we've done a lot in so many ways, but happiness wise, we're not much happier than we used to be. Um, this has not been a focus, but more schools are bringing in mindfulness. Even my uh, elementary school son is uh, getting exposed to it in his school. So it is becoming more popular and more trendy. Um, and so let's hope that uh, you know makes a difference. And uh, and Diana says the faculty needs self care. Yes, indeed. Uh, yeah, and so do staff, if I may speak for myself. Uh, however, I'm a little cautious about the term self-care. Certainly everything I've been talking about in this whole presentation is all self-care, right? But a lot of times we talk about self-care when in fact what oftentimes people really need is community care or just community in general. Uh, especially in the United States, people are more isolated than they've ever been. Um, and, you know, I've heard people be like, yeah, I know how to take a bath and pour myself a glass of wine in the bath. That's self-care, but it doesn't, you know, doesn't always solve all the problems we have. It's a certainly a useful, helpful thing. But I, whenever you do hear the word self-care, just think in your brain, hey, do you think my, that might also be useful if we had more community care as well? All right, well, thank you as well, Ramona. I appreciate uh, you all coming and uh, lending your ear. Um, yeah, okay. Well, we have about three minutes left and I understand that this uh, computer automatically shuts off at the half hour. So um, we've got three more minutes to talk about anything you want. Um, on this last slide, I do have a little YouTube link to a two minute video that I think sums up um, my idea is pretty well. And then at the bottom there, that book recommendation for uh, if you're interested in sort of a poetic philosophy, uh, the Tao Te Ching is a fascinating one to tickle your brain. Drop the YouTube link in the chat. Sure. Yeah, that sounds reasonable. Okay. There you go, there's a hot link. Okay. Well, I don't mind ending a minute early and uh, I really appreciate all of you coming and listening to this session. I uh, hope you're able to apply this. Uh, if you run into any uh, things that help you apply it or obstacles in applying it, I'd love to hear about it. This is my most favorite topic to talk about. Uh, my email address is, uh, well, I'm gonna put it in the chat here for you. All right. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, I hope you all have a great conference. I uh, appreciate you listening. Take care. And thank you, Devin. And we'd like to remind all of our participants to be sure and take advantage of our last day of TLC. We still have a full afternoon schedule. Thank you and have a great day. Mm -hmm.